Thank you. I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. I am honored, absolutely honored, to be invited to come back to this conference. I thought I was too old and too irrelevant to ever <laughs> be invited to speak at this most prestigious organic conference, sustainable conference in the country today. So uh, I'm glad to be back. It's been a great event so far. I've seen a lot of people that, uh, you know, that I've known, seen from time to time over the years. I've met some new people here that's very important. So I've had a, had a good time being here. I, I enjoyed uh, Leah Peniman's um, presentation on social justice. And I want to talk about economic justice from a different perspective, but I thought it was kind of ironic that you would ask an old white man to get up here and talk about economic justice. Um, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm aware of the position of privilege that I've had by being white and being a man. And I fully, I fully recognize and appreciate that. But I do want you to know that I wasn't born into wealth or I wasn't even born into to comfort as far as that goes. My dad's died when he was, uh, dad's, uh, dad's dad died when he was in the fourth grade and he left school in the fourth grade and went to work on farms and he was able during the Great Depression years to buy a farm that had been lost during the Great Depression for $10,000 and, and we paid it off. And I lived my early years without electricity and running water. I went home my junior year in college to help my brothers dig a septic tank for our house. And we had the farm payments that we had to be made every fall and what we ate during the winter depended a whole lot on whether there were any hogs left after you sold the hogs to make the farm payments. And I can remember a few winters that we went through with squirrels and rabbits and fish and greens that my mother canned from the field. But having said all of that, I realized that I have had privileges by being white and being a man that have not been available to many other people, minorities and females through the lifetime. And I have two daughters that I have some of that experience. So I do want to talk about economic inequity, but I want to talk about economic inequity that affects everyone, regardless of their race or gender or anything else characteristics about them. And I want to frame my discussion of economic inequity around farming. When I spoke in 1999 at this conference, I spoke about the future of farming, specifically of small independent family farms. And I quoted, I started off that presentation by quoting from the, the, the Future Farmer's Creed. I said, from the Future Farmer Creed, I believe in the future of farming with a faith born not of de words, but of deeds, achievement ones by present and past generations of farmers and the promise of better ways through better days, e better days through better ways, even as the better things we now enjoy have come up to us through the struggles of former years. I believed in that creed when I was a future farmer in the 50s, and I lived by it through much of my academic and professional life. But in 1999, I said I had, had real doubts about that. I said there would be no future for farming, for real farming, unless we made some significant changes from the trends that had been happening in agriculture. And I developed a paper for that conference, which is available if you want to get a copy of it at registration. I also have a paper of the presentation I have today, but the quotes I'll give you is directly from that. I said that every time the average farm size goes up, the number of farmers go down. Every time a farmer signs a corporate production contract, a farmer becomes a corporate hard hand. I said there will be no future in farming unless we have the courage to challenge and disprove the conventional wisdom that farmers must either get bigger or get out. You see, even then we were talking about a high-tech future for agriculture. We were talking about using computers to drive machines and robots and I would talk about, you know, even today, we were talking about that in the 1990s and there was a realization that the farmers weren't going to write the programs for those robots or those drones out there. They would be done off in a corporate headquarters somewhere or other and, and if the farmers thinking about running those from the, from the fa farm office, they could just as easily be run from from corporate headquarters in Chicago or Minneapolis or somewhere like we conduct drone warfare today. I said, if, if you have the kind of farming where the work is done by 
machines rather than real people and the thinking is done somewhere other than on the farm, that's no longer farming. It may be agricultural production, but that would be the end of farming. And I warned in that paper, and you can read it, even that organic farming was at risk. And I said, if organic becomes defined in terms of allowable materials and methods, then whoever can meet the minimum standards at the lowest possible cost is going to take control of it. And this is a quote, I said, materials and methods may be organic, but the paradigm of production will be industrial. Hey. Allowable materials and... <laughs> and I also wrote, I said, allowable materials and methods will be changed over time if necessary to accommodate the industrial paradigm. And I warned then, if we had one national standard for organic, we would have we would have standardized the process, allowing specialization and consolidation and control into larger and larger operations. I said then, and I still believe today, that the future of farming was and still is at risk. And I was talking about the future of the small independent family farms then, and that's my focus still today. But it wasn't a dismal message, it was hopeful because I talked about the sustainable agriculture movement, which I got involved in in the late 80s, and I said, I said the sustainable agriculture movement has new promise for independent family farms and the future of farming. Because I said sustainability, as it was defined then and is still defined by those of us that take it seriously, sustainability is the ability to meet the needs of the present without diminishing opportunities for the future. It's a word that's been abused and misused intentionally, so you can do about anything and call it sustainable, but that's what it means. And you can't be sustainable, you can't meet the needs of the present without diminishing opportunities for the future unless it is ecologically sound, that's where everything of use comes from, unless it is socially responsible because we get the well-being from nature by the way of people and it has to be economically viable over the long run. And I said, that's basically what family farming has always been about, at least the ideal of family farming. It wasn't just a way to make money, it wasn't just a way to, of a business, it was a way to make a, a living, but it, it was also a, a, a way of life. A, 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 an ethical and social way of life. To be a part of a community, to be a caretaker of the land and of the earth. And I said then and still believe today that that, that is easier to be sustainable in terms of ecological, economic, and social with, with the ideals of a family farm as a socially and ethically responsible way of life as well as a making a living. I'm not saying it's impossible on a law farm, but it's just, it's just easier on a diversified small family farm. In addition to that, I saw sustainable agriculture as the post-industrial paradigm or model for American agriculture. Sustainable agriculture evolved in the late in the 80s and 1990s, and, and it was brought on specifically to address the problems that were arising from industrial agriculture, the ecological, environmental problems, and the social problems. Industrial agriculture, as I've talked about many times, is characterized by specialization, standardization, mechanization, but you, and consolidation of control once you've specialized and specialized and standardized and medicalized in larger and larger farming operations. But that doesn't fit the nature of the land and it doesn't fit the nature of the community. And we see environmental problems and social problems arising from that. And one of the preoccupation of industrial agriculture on the economic bottom line, it's all about maximizing profits, economic efficiency, regardless of the social or the environmental consequences. The early emphasis in sustainable agriculture was on the environmental issues, addressing the environmental and conservation issues that were raised by an industrial agriculture. But we have to remember, and it, it comes out as well in sustainability, the first requisite of sustainability is meeting the needs of the present. It's about social responsibility. It's making, about, making sure that everybody has access to good food. It's about it's about food security as well as ecological 
integrity over the long run. You know, it's about social and ecological degradation of rural communities that we've seen as a consequence of the industrialization of agriculture and the disappearance of the family farm, all in the pursuit of more and more money. I, I saw sustainable agriculture as the solution to the industrial agriculture problem. You know, it, it, sustainable agriculture is, is kind of knowledge intensive, whether we're talking about real organic or ecological agriculture, biological agriculture, holistic resource management, biodynamic, regenerative. All of these depend upon farmers who have a, a knowledge and an understanding of what's going on in the soil and how soils and plants and animals relate to each other and how farmers relate to their neighbors and to their community as a whole. It's a knowledge intensive kind of industry. My late friend Dick Thompson used to say that sustainable farming was carried out by, by thinking workers and worker working thinkers, that both of those things were important because you had to understand how to work with the land and with people, and you had to be out there with your, your hands and be in direct contact with people. In economics, we call that kind of operation a management-intensive operation that relies more on management and family labor and less on having more land and less on capital per farm that you farmed. And so that means that the farms would be smaller, less land, less capital, relying more on knowledge, more on management, more on family labor rather than hired labor. And we talked about an agriculture that was low input, that relied on managing the resources on the farm rather than relying on off-farm input. And I saw sustainable agriculture as reversing that trend toward ever larger and ever fewer family farms. And I certainly wasn't along in talking about the possibility of a great transformation in agriculture because there were futurists at that time that saw a great transformation across the whole of society. And I quoted people like Alvin Toffler and Robert Reich and, and John Nesbitt and a few of the others. But I, I closed with a quote with Peter Drucker, who was basically the guy that invented business management and written a lot of books and was a consultant. And Peter Drucker wrote in his latest book, he said, every few hundred years in Western history, there occurs a sharp transformation. So society rearranges itself, its worldview, its basic values, its social and political structure, its arts. In a few decades, we have a new world. He wrote, we're currently living through such a transformation. In the knowledge society into which we're moving, individuals are central. Knowledge is not impersonal like money. Knowledge does not reside in a book, a data bank, or a software program. Knowledge is always embodied in a person, carried by a person, created, augmented, and improved by a person, applied by a person, taught by a person, and passed on by a person. He said the shift to a knowledge society therefore puts the person in the center. That's what I saw in sustainable agriculture. That's what I saw in organic and biodynamic and ecological agriculture. It was putting people back in the center. I really thought within a few short decades we would see farmers, people, back in the center of agriculture. Whether it was an organic or ecological or biodynamic or regenerative, it would depend upon the people that were in the center. Not on more land, not on more capital, more on thoughtful, caring, knowledgeable people who were committed to taking care of their land and being good neighbors and leaving the land as good or better than they found it. I said in that paper, and I closed it this way, I said, in the society of the future, the society that puts people at the center, there will be a place of honor for sustainable small farms. It wasn't just about the farmers there that led me to that kind of hopeful vision for the future. It's that these knowledge workers that other people were talking about, not just in agriculture, but across society, those knowledge workers were be free to, to, to work and live anywhere they chose, and they saw that those people would increasingly choose the environment of rural communities, the pristine environment, the scenic landscapes, the bucolic sense of quality of life and community that was there. We were going to have people coming back to rural areas as well as the young people staying in rural areas. 
We, we were looking forward, I was looking forward and wrote about a, the coming of a rural renaissance in America, and farmers would be at the center of that. Looking back over 20 years, I was wrong. Obviously, I was wrong. The other futurists were wrong. Sustainable agriculture certainly hasn't gone away. Organic is still here. You still have the conferences bigger than ever. And you're even talking about having real organic as a defense against the industrial organic of the past. There's a currently a whole new emphasis on regenerative agriculture and holistic management and agroecology. These are the means by which we fight climate change, maybe even reverse it. These are the, the systems we talked about in the past. But there hasn't been any great transformation. There hasn't been a great transformation in agriculture overall. The corporate grip on agriculture, the large industrial operations that are controlled increasingly by the large corporate, that corporate grip on agriculture is even tighter today than it was when I made that talk more than 20 years ago. Our agriculture is more capital in centered and less knowledge centered than it was then. It is more profit centered and it is less people centered than it was then if we talk about agriculture as a whole. So what happened? Why didn't that hopeful future turn around? I think that I and all of the other futures, futurists at that time, we fail to appreciate and respect the corporate power to control not only agriculture, but to control our economy. We essentially in this country quit enforcing antitrust laws back in the 1980s. We turned loose the corporations with no anticipation on the part of the economists that once we did that, these larger and larger corporations would use their economic power to gain political power, which would mean they could then open up everything to continued exploitation and extraction because they would control the only means by which we as a society could protect ourselves from such. And so we've continued to see the corporate exploitation and extraction. And, and I've used the word before, and I think it's appropriate, called economic colonization. That's what we've seen across rural America out here. Economic colonization is what we... <laughs> economic colonization is, historically was associated with, with governments using their superior economic power to go to... Uh, areas that were previously politically colonized and continue the colonization process of extraction and exploitation by using economic power. But what we're seeing today is not economic colonization by governments, we're seeing economic colonization by the large multinational corporations that can increasingly accrue not only agriculture but also control our government systems out here today. And that's what we see. The false promises, they use the same thing. They go out in rural areas and they promise economic development out here. And they, they go to the local leaders and they promise them all sorts of things. And if they don't fall for economic development, they might even fall for a little uh, bribery of uh, maybe legal and maybe not. And that's the way they get a foothold in the area. And we end up, those false promises turned into increased pollution, increased exploitation extract and exploit not only the natural resources but the human resources, destroy our farmland, despite the fertility, and turn our farmers into corporate hard hands again. The knowledge workers didn't come to rural areas because they were polluted and degraded by the corporate exploitation of the areas. I won't want to dwell on it, but Wendell Berry, I think, describes it better. He's better with words than almost any of us, but he described it very eloquently in a 2017 letter to the book editor of the New York Times. And he says, the business of America has been largely and without apology the plundering of rural America, from which everything of value, minerals, timber, farm animals, farm crops, and labor, has been taken at the lowest possible price. He says, its two large fields are toxic and eroding, its streams and rivers poisoned, its forests mangled, its towns dying or dead along with locally owned small businesses, 
It's children leaving after high school and not coming back. Too many of the children are not working at anything. Too many are transfixed on various screens. Too many are on drugs. Too many are dying. This is not economic development. This is economic desecration. 2017 Wall Street Journal article called Rural Areas, the New Inner Cities. And it quoted the statistics. It said in terms of poverty, education, teen birth, divorce, premature death, disability, unemployment, rural areas now rank below the inner cities in all of those areas. Drug and crime were once problems of the city areas are now rampant all across rural communities. This is the legacy of agricultural industrialization. This is the legacy of what we have continued to build in our rural areas. And what did we get for it? We did not get food security, I was promised. We increased the efficiency of, of agriculture. And the 1970s, the 1990s, the percentage of money, that we, or spinach of our income that we spent on food did in fact go down. But since the 1990s, the late 1990s, the past 20 years, food prices have gone up faster than the overall cost of living. We didn't eliminate hunger. Food insecurity is higher now than it was in the 1960s. 1960s, the best estimates were is about 5% today, 11% of people in total. 14% of our kids, one in seven kids, live in food insecure homes. I, I signed on to the industrial agriculture movement because I think we were going to make good food affordable to everybody, but we didn't. And in addition to that, anything that we saved in terms of the price we, on average, that had plenty of food, spent on food, has been more than offset by increases in health care costs that have been related primarily to the American diet. We have an epidemic of obesity and diabetes and heart disease and high blood pressure and a whole range of cancers. We more than doubled the cost of health care at the time we were reducing the cost of food. Latest estimates by the year 20, 2026, more than 20 percent of our total economic output is going to go into health care, and a big part of that is associated to the so-called American modern diet that's come out of our industrial agriculture and our industrial food system. Why did, why did we allow that to happen? Or did we have any choice? Was it inevitable? Was it inevitable that in this, we have industrial agriculture as, as most of the agricultural establishment will lead you to believe? Well, I'd be the first to admit that it was the, it was the chemical and mechanical technologies that came out of World War II that, that basically made the industrialization of agriculture possible. It was the cheap fertilizers and pesticides in the farm tractors, affordable farm tractors. We didn't have a farm tractor until after World War II, and then they become affordable even for poor farmers back then. But it, that made it possible. But the industrialization of agriculture was made inevitable by the public policies, the farm policies that we put in place during the 1970s. That's what made it inevitable. You see, this industrial agricultural system, specialized in one crop, one species of livestock or whatever, specialized, standardized, mechanized, consolidate control, is a very efficient system in terms of efficiency of production, but it's a very risky system because you're putting all this money into, say, one crop. You've got a, a combine out here that may cost you a half a million dollars. You've got to have thousands of acres of land out here. You've got to pay for the crop to put it out here. Or if you're in livestock, you build a confinement facility that cost you a million dollars for a minimum one and a millions on up from there. There's huge investments in those operations, and you're putting them into operations that are in, inherently vulnerable to the vagaries of nature in terms of the crops that's it's the weather conditions that are getting more variable and unpredictable all the time of a late spring or an early fall or an unexpected frost or a flood or a drought or an outbreak of pests. And if you've got animals in confinement, you have diseases that you have to worry about. And if the fans go out, they all die and things of that nature. It's a very risky business. So what do we do? We develop farm policies in the 1970s so that we, the taxpayer, pick up the lion's share of those risks. 
And if things turn out good, then the producer makes the profit, but we take the risk. Regardless of what programs you look at, the early price support program said if you have an overproduction in this chronic market where we have overproduction every few years and the prices fall, we'll support the price. You don't have to take the low prices when they go down. We're moving it into crop insurance now where you can go out and buy crop insurance and then you can insure not only the yield but you can insure the price and we the taxpayers pick up 60% of the crop of that crop insurance. And if there's a disaster the crop insurance won't cover, then we have disaster payments that we vote. It's amazing in, in Iowa where if you can't raise a crop in ag Iowa, I say don't try it in the other places I've been, Oklahoma, Georgia, or even Missouri. I, we, we have several areas in Iowa every year that the governor declares disaster areas in agriculture because of dry weather, floods, or whatever's going on out here. We pick up we have loan guarantees for people that want to go out and build CAFOs. We'll pick up, we'll guarantee 80 or 90 percent of that million dollar loan out here. We have investment tax credits and different tax rates and so on. All of that is where we the taxpayers are picking up the risk for this tremendously efficient but very risky business. It's much like the financial industry and the banks where, where the, the banks make the profit and the consumers take the risk and that's what we've done in general with farm policies for the past 50 years. You know, it, it was a bold experiment and it was well intended. I, I even supported those policies through the first half of my 30 year academic career. I really believed in what we were going to do. We were going to make agriculture more efficient. It's going to bring down the cost of food. We were going to make good food affordable to everybody. These new technologies were going to create profit opportunities for the innovative farmers. We were going to have prosperous farmers. We were going to have uh, prosperous rural communities. It was going to be good for, for everyone. But as it turned out, it was none of those things. It, it, it was none of those things. We didn't feed the hungry. It wasn't good for farmers. It wasn't good for rural communities. But now we're caught in a situation where farmers feel trapped. They're trapped by the large investments that they've made in industrial agriculture. They're trapped by those farm policies that basically enable them and entice them to continue doing it. They're trapped by a, a, an industrial modern agricultural culture, the culture that says this is the future of farming. You want a young people starting agriculture, what's the conventional wisdom out here is go build a CAFO. They're doing the things that are supported by the USDA and by their State Department of Agriculture and by the Farm Bureau and the Commodity Association. They, they feel trapped in this. So how are we going to claim, reclaim the future of farming in a situation that looks dismal? Well, I had a, a professor in college at the time, and he was on my PhD committee by the name of Harold Brymar. Harold had spent many years in USDA in Washington and farm policy. He was one of the most respected agricultural economists in the country. He'd been president of the American Ag Econ Association. He was a fellow of the association and so on. And, 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 and Harold Brymar would always say, we can have any kind of farming in this country that we want. He says, all we have to do is develop and implement the right kind of farm policy and we'll get it. He was right. We developed a farm policy to support industrial agriculture in the 1970s and we got it. We simply did not anticipate the negative consequences of doing so. And if we develop a fundamentally different farm policy today, we have a, a greater opportunity today to change agriculture than they had back in the 1970s. You talk about the organic movement, the regenerative agriculture, holistic management, agroecology, tremendous research base in agriculture, agroecology globally. We are farther along today in terms of moving to a sustainable agriculture by far than we were toward moving toward an industrial agriculture in the 1970s when we changed policies. If we change policies, fundamentally change policies, I'm convinced we can change agriculture and there can be a different future. 
You say, well, what will it take to do that? I, I think it'll take nothing less than a consumer and taxpayer revolt against agriculture, the agriculture that we have, and the farm policies that have created this kind of agriculture. It will require a revolution on part of the people because the corporate grip on our agricultural policy is strong in federal governments and in state governments all across this country. They exert that pressure not only through, you know, funding universities and doing things like that, but all of the promises that they put in in terms of economic development. They have strong support and they control the policies. Every farm bill we get, they promise they're going to protect the natural resources, preserve family farms, and every time we renew a farm bill, our rural areas are more polluted and degraded, and there are fewer and fewer farmers. It takes a revolt against that if we're going to change policies. And if we're going to talk about changing farm policies and changing them fundamentally, I think we need to start with kind of the foundation of what's the fundamental justification for farm policy, and I think it is as it has always been, to provide food security for this nation. We need to focus on that once again. That was the justification for farm policies originally in the 1930s. We were in the middle of the Great Depression and farmers were going broke and there was concern that so many farmers will leave the farm that the food of the nation would be insecure. And so they said, we're gonna support those family farmers by supporting their, we had price supports, but the price supports were intended to provide economic security for family farmers, and we trusted the family farmers to stay on the farm and to feed the nation. That was the justification. That's the only justification logical for the Department of Agriculture and the policies that we have there. You could put the energy policies over biofuels over in the energy and exports and commerce and various things of that nature, but it's food security. Food security was really the promise that was given in the 1970s when we changed policies and Nixon and Butts come in and they were saying hunger had persisted in the 1960s. If we're going to deal with that, then we needed to change policies and begin to focus on increasing agricultural efficiency and bringing down the cost of food rather than just supporting family farmers. And industrial agriculture was out there ready to go. And they said, we don't care how many farmers we have because all we care about is producing food for people. And now we talk about we're going to feed the world, which is a big fallacy, but it's all supported in that. We need to understand that that's, that that's where we're going, that it's about food security. And for the first time since the 1970s, I see the possibility, the opportunity for a fundamental change in farm policies based on the concept of food security, but also climate security, social security, economic security, all inseparable parts of the same whole. And I see that put in words in the Green New Deal. And I realize some of you may say, well, that's, that's a fallacy or whatever. Because the Green New Deal, the most of the emphasis gets on climate change because that's the high profile policy right now. But you go and read the Green New Deal, it goes far beyond in, even in agriculture in terms of reducing fossil fuel emissions and, and greenhouse emissions and sequestering carbon. It goes far beyond and realizes that, that social problems, the ecological problems, the economic problems are all part of the same whole. And we have to deal with them as a part of the same whole. The Green New Deal is, is not a law. It's not on the books. Haven't even been seriously debated. Never even voted on. So why you get excited about the Green New Deal? Well, I get excited about it because it's been endorsed by all of the major Democratic candidates that are running for office this year, and not because that will get them elected or it will be enacted, but these people have their fingers on the pulse of the American people, and they know that there's a public mood arising, that public perceptions are changing, and that the Green New Deal is something that's going to gain them popular and political support. And they know a lot more about that than you and I do. That's what makes me hopeful for the future out here. The Green New Deal is going to be opposed by the agricultural establishment because they know that it means fundamental change. It's something fundamentally different. It's going to be opposed by many of the farmers that feel trapped in the industrial agricultural system out here today. We can get ready for that. It'll have opposition. But it's supported by a lot of progressive farmers and farm organizations and activist organizations all around the country. 
And there are thousands of nonprofit organizations that have come into being, hundreds of thousands, even since the 90s, that are out there today and moving in a positive direction. The Green New Deal, most people don't talk about it in terms of farm policy, but it would fundamentally change farm policy from supporting industrial agriculture to supporting sustainable farms and sustainable land use. It says in the language, and I quote from it directly, it says, it will require the following goals and projects, working collaboratively with farmers and ranchers in the United States to reduce pollution and greenhouse gas emissions by supporting family farming, by investing in sustainable agriculture and land use practices that increase soil health. It would ensure long run food security. It says, and I quote again, by building a more sustainable food system that ensures universal access to healthy food, by restoring natural ecosystems through proven low-tech solutions that increase soil carbon storage, by restoring and protecting threatened and, and fragile ecosystems and enhance biodiversity and climate resilience. If you implement policies according to that agenda, and you fundamentally change the nature of agriculture and food policies in this country. The Green New Deal is supported by a lot of different organizations out here, and one of those, and particularly organizations made up of young people, that's what makes me more positive about the possibilities for the future. One of them is called Data for Progress. They're supporting the Sunrise Movement, uh, which brought along and promoted the Green New Deal to begin with. And um, I've worked with a group in there, young people. The primary author is 23 years old. She said it's kind of funny that you got a 23-year-old working with an 80-year-old to put together a report. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting, don't you think? But anyway, if you want to look it up, it's called... <laughs> she was the primary author, and she speaks well of it. She's very, very good. If you want to look it up, it's called Regenerative Farming and the Green New Deal. And it lays out a set of not detailed possibly agenda, but but directions that we need to go. It says basically in four different areas, we reform the whole crop insurance program that we got today, require conservation compliance. I would require environmental compliance in order to qualify to subsidize the insurance to begin with, to limit the overall coverage to family-sized farming operations. I mean size that it would take to support a family with a diversified farming operation, limit the revenue over time to phase out programs that are insure specific commodities so that it allows you to specialize in this particular thing. Phase it out over time. Phase out commodity programs that encourage overproduction. Replace the insurance program for individual commodities with a whole farm net revenue insurance. Going back to the basic idea of the 1930s that what we need to do is insure farm families with parity income. That's what originally parity prices were about. It would say if you want to make the transition from commodity, industrial agriculture, to regenerative, sustainable, organic agriculture, put together a whole farm plan that moves you in that direction, and we will guarantee you as taxpayers, we will ensure a level of family income, net family income, that's on par with non-family income in your area as you move through that transition. We're taking all of the risk for the big corporate operations. Let's shift some of that taxpayer money over and support some people that are doing the things that we want done and need done rather than the things that are destroying our environment and our community. It says, let's use the existing program, since it's the conservation security program, the equip program, that pay farmer for culture. Let's use them to prepare farmers for the transition. Commodity farmers, use them, use that so that they can make the transition, begin to learn how to do things differently. We don't want to just drop everybody that's been locked into this government program and this kind of agriculture. We want to make it possible for them to go. We need to shift the whole research and education agenda of our research, of our land grant universities. I spent 30 years in there and I'm embarrassed to say the kind of, they've helped create the kind of agriculture, industrial agriculture we got today. Shift that whole agenda as we did in the 1970s. Rather than supporting industrial agriculture, we support regenerative, sustainable agriculture. Then we spread the word out here among farmers and it becomes no longer an embarrassment because you're an organic farmer or a biodynamic or farmer or whatever, but because you're supported by the institutions you should be depend upon for directions into the future. So how do we get all this done? Well, let me point out first that the, the skeptics 
criticize what we've done. They say, well, the Green New Deal lacking in policy details. Well, it was never meant to be policy details. It's meant to outline certain fundamental principles that will move policies in the direction we want them to go, just as they outlined industrial principles back in the 70s, outline a new set of principles for the future. But how do we get that done? Well, a, a, a colleague and, and uh, an expert really in the whole area of international sustainability, agroecology, is one of the leading experts in the area. She talks about transformational change, and that's what we're talking about here. She says, among the requirements for transformation is a citizenry that is sufficiently outraged by business as usual to demand change by electing people to public office that will support the public good instead of the private interest and then holding those officials accountable. Yeah. I, I think the Green New Deal is an expression of outrage, particularly among the young people out here today that, that look at us older people and say, you built something that may last through your lifetime, but what you've created is not going to last through ours. We're going to have to change things dramatically to create a positive future, not only for ourselves, but our children and our children beyond that. I think it's an expression of outrage, of the failure of government to live up to its fundamental responsibility. What kind of outrage would bring about that change? I think we need an outrage like we had in this country during the time of the American Revolution. And it's expressed. A Green New Deal, in many senses, is a, is a, is a reaffirmation of what was in that Declaration of Independence. It says the fundamental purpose of government is to is to ensure, secure the fundamental rights of people. The Green New Deal starts off, it says, it is the duty of the federal government to secure for all people, for generations to come, clean air and water, climate and community resilience, healthy food, access to nature, a sustainable environment, and to promote equity and justice by stopping and repairing oppression to people indigenous people, minorities, and it includes rural people among those who have been historically, historically oppressed. I say it is a reaffirmation of the Declaration of Independence because the Declaration of Independence starts, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And many people know these, but they don't know the next line. Then it says, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. It says, that's the fundamental purpose of government. And it says, when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, meaning it fails to secure this right, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and replace it by a system of government that seems most likely to secure their safety and happiness. Folks, what I'm talking about here is not socialism. It's not politically democratic or politically republican. It is the foundational principles of this country. We have never lived up to those principles. We have never lived up to those standards, but they are still standards to which we must continue to aspire. Just like the, I mentioned the image of the family farm. We've never lived up to the image of the family farm, but that image of the family farm as a, a socially and morally responsible way of life as well as a making a living is an idea to which we should continue to aspire. And if we have a right to life, we have a right to clean air, clean water. Those are essential for life and essential to have the liberty to pursue happiness. That is American democracy. Young people in particular are outraged. They, they are demanding change. And they're demanding change in agriculture from an agriculture that's polluting their air and the water and tainting their food and destroying the environment and threatening the future of them and their children into the future. 
They are outraged by the inaction of government, and they want real change. I believe we can, and I believe that we will, eventually elect people to public office who will support the public good instead of private interest and will hold the public officials accountable. We have the best opportunity in the past 50 years to bring about fundamental change. I still have hope for the future of small family farms. I still have hope for a rural renaissance. I still believe in the future of farming, even if it's based more on faith than deeds of past farming. I believe, I have, I have faith that together we can reclaim that future of farming that I saw 20-some years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.